Atina Koto Kato, the Mihi Nui Kia Koto, uh, he Mahan, he Mihi Mahana Kia Koto Kato, uh, Kotun Fella Tokungo, Koi, Pofaka Hari, or Tamarani Mata, and a Matawa, uh, no my Hari Mai, uh, Kitakuro, Mitamahi Na Tahi, no my Hari Mai, uh, Kitakuro Na, uh, inspiring the future. No Red Atina Koto Kato. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, my name is Tim Fowler. I'm the CEO of the Tertiary Education Commission, uh, the folks behind Inspiring the Future. And um, very uh, warm welcome to you this evening to learn a bit more about uh, the Inspiring the Future program. Can I just ask you, you'll see there is a, um, a slide up already. If I can just reiterate what's in there, which is if you, when you come in, can you please turn off your microphone, uh, turn the camera off and open the chat box. Uh, we're going to use the chat box for questions, which we'll do later on. And I just got a quick reminder for you that we are, in fact, actually recording this, uh, and that will be made available uh, as well uh, through the TEC. And of course, we, if, you, if you want to access live captions, you can do so via those three horizontal dots uh, on Microsoft Teams. So. Um, this evening's, um, I'll get to the uh, the hymn sheet in a minute, the agenda. Um, this evening, I'm going to be telling you uh, about the genesis of uh, Inspiring the Future and actually how it works. I'm thrilled to have a bunch of uh, my staff with me tonight, um, some very dedicated folks who are totally into this uh, this mahi. Um, so Sam Greenstead is the product owner of the Inspiring the Future website uh, and the online platform, and he is going to be walking you through some of that later on. And I've also got uh, Nina, uh, Andrea, and Kelsey with me as well. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora tato. There he is. As promised, here's the hymn sheet. Um, so, we're going to have, hopefully, I think we're going to get towards 25, 30 minutes, um, Prezo, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and then get some questions at the end. Uh, we're going to start off with why uh, we're doing Inspiring the Future and, and, the, and the, the work behind that, which is the Drawing the Future work, which is extremely interesting. And I think that'll give you a really strong understanding as to why we're doing what we're doing, describing what Inspiring the Future is, and then the resources uh, for role models in schools. Um, and uh, Sam is then going to take over and explain and show you how our online platform works. And most importantly, how you can get involved. In the first instance, let me tell you a little bit about TC. As you know, why is the government's funding agency in tertiary education uh, behind this particular piece of work? So, uh, TC is a, a crown entity and um, is the government's funder for tertiary education. We invest around four billion dollars every year in the tertiary education sector. So, in universities. Polytechnics, Wananga, uh, private training providers, industry training and apprenticeships, uh, and the like. Um, but in 2017, um, the Careers New Zealand, another crown entity, was merged into our organisation, and we've now got the privilege of also being the government's careers agency responsible for providing careers information and uh, services and advice. Our vision at the TEC is for a resilient, prosperous New Zealand where every person has the skills, knowledge, and confidence to create a fulfilling life. And it's very clear to us that that's not actually possible unless we have equ equitable outcomes for all. And being able to provide uh, coherent um, career services, not just to school children, but to all New Zealanders, uh, supports them along the way in terms of being able to actually uh, expand their horizons and find jobs that are fulfilling and meaningful and so they can contribute to our economy and our society. That's really what drove us into getting into inspiring uh, the future. Um, and I think the first place to start really is talking uh, about drawing the future. So uh, drawing the future is uh, international research um, uh, that looked at the aspirations of children all around the world um, a variety of countries have participated in this work from Australia to Uganda. Um, and, this ch and children were asked to draw what they thought they'd like to be when they grew up and to answer some simple questions. 
and the research is absolutely fascinating. Um, it was, and I've got a few um, specific notes I might just read from here because there's some really interesting stuff in here that I'd like to share with you. The first thing the research showed uh, was that young people begin to form um, their aspirations um, as early as the age of seven. But normally those aspirations are quite narrow uh, with many choosing the same jobs. Aspirations tend to reflect uh, stereotypes around uh, gender, ethnicity and socioeconomic uh, areas. Um, and their aspirations tend to also reflect um, exposure to the people they know who do those jobs. Really importantly, it was very clear that their aspirations don't reflect the future needs um, of the market uh, or what the future of work looks like. Now, one thing I did want to stress at this point is that um, if you uh, listen to um, you know, the ZB network or something, you might be confused who have commented on this sort of stuff saying, well, what the hell are we doing actually having New Zealanders actually try and um, pick a career when they're you know, seven, eight or nine or ten? And of course, that is precisely not the point. We're not asking them to do that. We're just asking them to you know, and aspire to something. And what would that something be? Because it's really interesting what the research also demonstrated for us is that um, children's aspirations at this age are highly predictive of the jobs they actually end up in as adults. Introducing potential jobs um, at a primary school age therefore broadens uh, people's aspirations uh, and increases the relevance of school learning uh, to the real world. And of course, it also challenges stereotypes. So the more young people are encountering uh, people from the world of work within their school environment, the more they're going to learn and the greater their chances are of entering employment or training uh, in, in different areas as adults. Um, one of the other things that was actually really um, obvious out of the research was that young people that had the most to gain from actually meeting people from the world of work or from those individuals um, in, in this particular job were usually the people who had the least access to it. So where that led us to was we think we need to do that research in New Zealand. So in 2019, we asked uh, New Zealand primary school students between the ages of seven and 13 to draw what they thought they'd like to be when they grew up. We were absolutely overwhelmed with the um, response, which led to 7,700 plus students uh, responding to us. Well, this is where it gets interesting. What we found was that over 52% of those 7,700 kids um, drew themselves in roles in one of just nine most popular jobs. So a little bit of uh, webinar interaction for you here. What we're going to ask you to do is before I do a bit of a reveal on what those nine jobs were, just going to give you the better part of what, 90 odd seconds maybe, um, to enter in the chat box what you think one or more of those nine roles might have been. So based on the research, what do you think New Zealand school kids between the age of seven and 13 think those jobs would have been in terms of the most uh, the most popular things that they would aspire to be? I'll leave you to it. So we're seeing doctor and police in there, nurse, truck driver, firefighter, police person, farmer, Cockies will be happy, they get represented. Yeah, nice. I see um, someone's put in the influencer. Thank you. Whoever HG is. Sports person, MP, thank you. Air hostess. All righty. Thank you. Brilliant. Let's move on to the next slide, Andrew, and we'll give the we'll let people um, out, get people out of their misery. So, um, this is what the results actually were. So, the person who said sports person was dead set right. Uh, Seventeen point six percent is by far the most popular role um, uh, for young New Zealanders. Interestingly, um, what we're seeing here, um, especially in relation to sports person. Uh, vet, police officer, and lecturers and teachers and so on is pretty much the same across many countries. Uh, sports person is is the is by far the highest, especially for boys, uh, in pretty much every country that does this research. 
There are some peculiarly New Zealand things in there though. Um, so farmer doesn't make the top 10 in many countries, don't, definitely does here, um, which is which is great to see um, insofar as we've had a, a major issue over the last decade of actually trying to get more New Zealand kids involved um, in things to do with the food and fibre, which is now what we call agriculture. So let's look at some of the really, um, you know, the below, below the line results. Boys four times more likely to aspire to be an engineer than girls. Girls 10 times more likely than boys to aspire to be a teacher. Um, worryingly, um, Māori children um, are less likely to aspire to a science, technology, engineering, maths career uh, than their peers and children at lower DSI schools much less likely to aspire into um, roles in the professions. Just in case you are sitting out there as an IT person, 56th is where they ranked um, out of the 112 roles. Um, accountant, 72. Politician, not many politicians on tonight, I suspect, 74th. Journalist, 93rd. Um, uh, all behind fast food workers who ranked at 26. The point here clearly um, is that you can't be what you can't see. So no matter what um, walk of life you come from, um, having access to different people doing different careers is going to just, just immediately open up the different um, ideas and opportunities and aspirations um, for young children. So really, this is what for us is behind inspiring the future and really what drove us to look internationally for ways in which we could actually influence um, those sorts of, the sorts of things that we were seeing from the research. So inspiring the future in a nutshell uh, are events hosted by schools who invite volunteers from the world of work uh, to talk to students about um, their job, the pathway that they use to get to their job, and then the challenges that they face um, along the way or the challenges that they face in their job. The aim is very, very simple. The aim is to actually broaden kids' horizons uh, and challenge stereotypes that hold them back, such as the ones that I've just mentioned. So the way it works is that volunteers sign up as role models. Uh, schools then also sign up and they host events by inviting those role models to attend their school. Uh, uh, at those events, the role models, as I've just said, share about their story. Um, and what we found from that, uh, we've been trialling this for the better part of about 15 months. Um, I've actually attended um, several events um, in the UK when we were doing the initial research and we've actually trialled it and changed it to actually suit uh, our um, Aotearoa New Zealand uh, setting. Um, and what we've found is that it suits um, primary and intermediate school students really well. And I think our initial view is that it also suits uh, years nine and 10 at college uh, equally well. Given the post-COVID, can I say post-COVID yet, uh, world that we live in, um, we're going with um, both in-person and online events. So let's have a week, just a quick look at what happens at an individual um, Inspiring the Future event. The way it starts off is um, we go through a process of the kids asking the role models 20 questions. If it was my mother-in-law, it would be, in terms of what I get, it's normally 60 questions uh, in less than 60 minutes. Um, and the idea is just the kids are asking um, questions about, well, you know, um, do you wear a uniform? Uh, do you work with children? Did you have to go to university? Did you have to study, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get your job? The role models then go off the stage and they either dress back into the clobber that they would work in, uh, maybe a uniform, or they would bring back onto the stage some of the props or materials and equipment that they might use at work, and they reveal um, what they do. And they therefore tell a little bit about what they do, how they got into that role, and the way their job works. We then break the kids down into smaller groups so, so they can have those, you know, more um, more relaxed discussions and um, and, a, and a corridor around uh, the individual roles that those people uh, work in in the role model sense. And of course, it allows those kids who don't want to speak up uh, in the larger groups to really ask the questions that they're dying to ask. 
What we're going to do now is show you a, a, a quick clip. It's a approximately two minutes, 12 seconds long from Brandon Street Intermediate uh, in Porirua. And um, it's right from a trial event that we ran uh, a wee while ago. And I think it just in a really short, really cool video demonstrates exactly how it looks and how it works. Let's go. Volunteers up here. Any question you want, as long as it's a yes or no question. Does your job involve designing things? Yes! <laughs> the aim is to find out exactly what our volunteers do. Do you work with computers? Do you have to wear a uniform? Yes. No. Yes? Do you work with children? Um, in your job, do you have to do like mathematical stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Inspiring future um, has allowed me just to open up some new ideas. I think he's like an actor. Maybe a youth worker. Number five could be a doctor because she works with children and she also said that she saves people. I stand here in front of our people today as a software engineer. Um, I am a landscape architect. Uh, I'm a plumber and guest builder. <laughs> I'm actually an astrobiologist. What we're going to do is we're going to get you guys into six groups. It's so important to wake up in the morning to look forward to going to your job. It was just really good just to chat with a lot of these kids as well because um, you know, a lot of them thought that they could only go down a certain pathway. Well, thank you guys. Uh, I thought Inspire the Future was really cool. It inspired kids to um, follow their dreams. This didn't happen when I was at school. And if I had the same kind of opportunities, then, oh, I would not go see the mistakes I would do. <laughs> yeah, we really want to see our, our children succeed. I think it's been a real um, amazing experience for students. Just planting seeds. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Well, as you can see, um, great engagement with the role models and, of course, with the students. What we also do, of course, is run online events and um, slightly different uh, arrangement, obviously, because it's not going to be face to face. Uh, we start off in that situation with an investigation session where we break utilizing teams. We break down into smaller groups and uh, children are asking similar questions, but into into smaller groups. Similarly, we go back and do the reveal and then do a bit of a show and tell uh, at the end. All of this, as you can imagine, um, takes a fair bit of organising. So what we have sought to do in terms of the way in which we have uh, set up the technology to support it and the processes and systems and resources around it is to take all the hassle out of this for both the role model and especially for the schools who, who are taking the time and effort to bring people into their schools. Um, so we've developed an online platform uh, that, that uh, allows you to set up events, connect with schools, and to support the process of people becoming role models. Um, so in the first instance, volunteers sign up online, create their profile, and do a criminal record check. My lovely wife Louise did this last night, and I can tell you reliably it takes less than five minutes to do and is a really, really simple process. Now that the online, um, that the criminal record check is also online, I think that's a really easy way to now go through the process um, that's really important to be done by the Ministry of Justice. Um, so what happens then is that um, an inspiring the, inspiring the Future role model uh, becomes available on the platform for teachers who are running the event to invite them to an event. Uh, the schools then create an event online uh, by reading, uh, go through and read the profiles of all the role models, and they select people to come along to the event. So, um, role models then go through a bit of a process of uh, accepting um, accepting the event or not, so they can choose whatever they prefer. 
Um, we like to say that this is about a four or five hour investment um, per year. If you did this once, this would be you know a maximum of five hours uh, out of your day in terms of the prep, the travel, uh, and actually being there for the event. My uh, my experience with this, especially from the folks that we've worked with in the UK, um, is that um, role role models, the volunteers. Once they've done it once, they get a bit of the bug and actually just love, um, you know, responding to requests and invites and do it far more than that because it's actually so satisfying. It does take a little bit of um, effort to set up and I think we'll, we'll walk through what that does, uh, how that works for role models as well as for schools. So we have um, we've got some feedback in here from people who have already been involved um, in this particular piece of work. Um, this good looking bloke here is uh, Kyle Barrett uh, Wilson, one of our TC Fano, and um, one, he's got a great quote here. He said that the biggest ah moment was when the kids realised, and this is at the school he was at, um, was that te reo and tikanga Māori and a degree in Māori studies made for a viable, good career choice. Um, and that in its own right, I think, is really, really valuable. Still got more people joining, which is absolutely fantastic. Now I've got a little video um, of um, Alicia and Hush, who um, also were, uh, who took part uh, in, as volunteers and role models. So we'll show you that now and see what it looks like. Don't overthink it too much. Like if you have that means of, oh, maybe you should do it, do it. Just do it. Uh, it's a fun experience. There's no pressure. The children are really cool. And you don't have to make a big deal out of it, it's just like a nice conversation. You have the ability to unknowingly inspire somebody. Don't take away that opportunity from that. Be that opportunity for somebody. Because you never know who you are inspiring and how. And you will make that kid through this program in some school. Right. But one of the other things I think that's really important, and we've been thinking a lot about this, is actually how we make this uh, accessible um, and easy for for teachers to to run. And um, so we've had some uh, brilliant support on the trial process uh, from teachers. Uh, you'll notice Linda Stewart's name in there, uh, the ex president of the um, NZEI. Um, I mean, I saw her a couple of years back when she was um, still at NZEI because um, we wanted to get um, her on board and within five minutes she was sold on this and to the extent that she said when I go back to my May Road school please come and run a trial with us and of course that's exactly what she's done. So you can see there that um, the feedback from uh, the teaching uh, community is also really really good. The most important people in this equation of course are the kids themselves uh, and once again I think um, you'll see from the video but also from these quotes here that um, Doing something that's fun and uh, simple to access and just gives people a bit of an opportunity to actually think outside their normal day to day um, was pretty cool for the kids as well. So resources for role models in schools and this I think is particularly important because we have gone through a, a major process of developing, uh, I'm going to say out of the box because literally out of the box is what we have done. I've got just one set of resources here. This is the the out of the box stuff that goes to um, to schools. Um, so whether it's for role models or for uh, for schools, we've provided um, a bunch of stuff that makes it nice and easy for you to access. In the case of role models, step by step guide in the first instance, uh, tips and tricks video, and a cultural competency guide because there will be some schools that either are bilingual um, or full immersion. Um, we're having that sort of uh, understanding um, is really particularly important. Um, I've already showed you the box out of the box, um, but we provide uh, that box contains a, a variety of free printed resource pack material that allows you to, to everything that you'd possibly want to um, to run an event, um, everything from um, templated invitations, um, a run sheet, name tags, signage. You'll see some of the signage that we had uh, on the video there. All that sort of stuff gets sent to you to enable you to easily run it. We also have a fully um, uh, Te Reo Māori version of the resource pack 
available for those who would want it. So um, I am now going to hand over to my mate um, Sam, and he is going to walk you through uh, a bit of a prezzo on the online platform. Over to you, mate. Kia ora tato. Yamehi Tim. Yamehi Nui, nui Kia um, Just an just excellent, an excellent overview, overview um, of drawing the future drawing and inspiring the future. future. Um, really good really. segue into um, uh, into a bit of a platform showcase from myself. Um, kia ora, ko Sam, uh, ko Samaho, ko Greenstead, toko ingoa fano, uh, no ingarania ho, inoho ana oki poneki Newlands, e mahi ana oki te amorangi mataranga matua, uh, he product owner ho. Um, so my name's Sam Greenstead. I'm the product owner for this um, for the Inspiring the Future platform and or website and platform. Um, so as Tim kind of uh, explained there, the platform itself is really a tool for connection. So it's it's there to connect schools with role models, um, but it's also a tool for preparation as well. Um, and it's a platform where we can really prepare our, our role models and our teachers for inspiring the future events. Um, and the better we can prepare those, those users, um, the better experience that the children are gonna have at the events. Um, which I think is a, a really important point. Um, so what I'm going to do today is take everyone through the the journey of both our primary users. So our primary users being the role models uh, and the teachers. Um, just see if requesting controllers has worked. Looks like it has. Excellent. So um, we've got our, our shop front or our shop window, which is inspiringthefuture.org.nz. Um, and that's where anyone can go and actually find out a bit more about uh, the program and how to get involved. Um, here we expect all different types of people to go. So we, we expect, of course, role models and teachers and schools, but we also expect businesses and Fano and uh, the media and potentially uh, even students to go here and find out a little bit more on how to get involved in the, in the program. Um, we do have two primary users, though, for the platform. Um, for role models, um, for them, to, we want them to be engaged with the platform. Um, we want them to actually sign up and uh, create a profile. Uh, for teachers, we want them to sign up and create an event and then to actually find these role models to, to choose um, and to invite to their um, Inspiring the Future event at their school. So first I'll take you through the role model journey, um, how they actually become visible to schools on the platform, and then I'll take you through um, what that means for schools creating events and finding, finding role models on the platform. So uh, once a role model signed up, it's a basic sign up, first name, last name, email, and password. Um, we ask them to uh, basically complete a criminal record check, but also to, to create a profile. And there are, there are four steps to, to doing that. So there's the criminal record check. Uh, then we ask for some basic information, some information around their work experience, and then some preferences. Um, so the criminal record check itself, um, as Tim mentioned, it's all online now, which is great. It's really sped things up for us. Um, it, it's made the process a lot more efficient. Um, so last year, um, we decided that we uh, criminal record check all role models who wanted to be a part of the program. Um, now, this is obviously to reduce the risk of harm at an Inspiring the Future event. Um, so if we can criminal record check all our role models and as soon as they pass that record check, make them visible to teachers on the platform, um, then we're putting the safest role models um, that we can possibly offer um, in front of kids in a classroom. So that's essentially why we're doing it. Um, ultimately, it's up to the school who, do they, who they invite into their school, so it's by no means a green light, but as I say, it's reducing the risk of harm at an event. Um, so the process there, um, a role model will sign up and then we'll send them an email um, requesting a photocopy of their ID, so it's driving license or a passport. Once we've received that ID, then we'll send them a web form to fill out, really basic web form, um, and they'll submit that. That'll come back to us. We'll check it and send it to the Ministry of Justice, who will run their criminal record check. Um, they'll then send that criminal record, record to us, and we'll assess it and review it, um, and then make a decision on whether that particular role model is eligible um, for inspiring the future. Um, Obviously, every decision we make is up for discussion. It's quite a sensitive subject. Um, just because you've got a criminal record doesn't mean that uh, we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to pass you. Um, as I say, everything's up for discussion, um, and we want to have those conversations around criminal record checks up front. 
So that happens largely off the platform. Um, so kind of in it, that happens in the background. Um, what we want to do is get the role model to or encourage the role model to log back into the to the platform so they can start actually creating their, their profile, which is done separately to the criminal record check. So the first thing we want to get from the role model is their basic information. Um, and that's kind of the demographic information um, that is, is, is great for the teacher to understand, but it's also great for us and it helps us measure the diversity of our role models. Um, one of the value propositions of the platform is um, that we provide schools with a diverse wide range of role models um, and gathering this demographic information uh, will help us measure the success there and help us track the diversity of our role models. So this kind of information is really, really important to us. The next section, the third step for the, for the role model is entering their work experience. Um, so this is kind of the meteor information that's really going to sell the role model to the teacher, to the school. Um, and this is information about um, what they do for a living, but um, also the pathway they've taken to, to get to where they are today. Um, we want to know about their skills and strengths. Um, and as I said, this is really going to sell them to, to the teacher. Um, and this all appears on their profile once they're live on the platform. So the, the fourth and final step is the preferences step. Um, and that's where we're asking the role models to, to give us their preferred pronoun, um, what type of event they want to be a part of. So um, Tim mentioned earlier, we've got two types of events, which I'll go, I'll go into a little bit more detail later, but we've got the in-person event and online event. They can check both or they can check one or the other. Um, what they check determines how they're actually shown to the, um, to the teachers after they've created an event. Um, the final uh, step on preferences is, th is that um, are they happy to be contacted for research purposes? So the, the, the whole platform has been designed and, designed and developed with our users. So what I mean by that is every feature that we design and develop, um, we actually engage with either the role models or the teachers who might be using the platform or using that particular feature. So everything we create has kind of been validated by our users so we know when we push it out to the big wide world, it's going to work for those users. So if they do tick on yes, they're happy to be contacted for research purposes, then it's likely that we'll kind of email them and reach out for user testing or um, to fill out a survey, that kind of thing. So that's basically the, um, the journey that a, a role model will take to um, create their profile and to become visible on the platform. Um, so once they pass that criminal record check and they filled out all the mandatory information for creating their profile, um, that's when they become visible to teachers on the platform. Um, and then they go to their landing page and it's just a waiting game. They wait to be invited to an in Inspiring the Future event. So what does that mean for a teacher? Um, so teachers were asking them to actually uh, sign in or log on using their education sector logon. All teachers have one. Um, most teachers know about it and um, really, really easy to access, really, really easy to find the credentials for as well. Um, we've used this application because it's a way of authenticating teachers as, as being real teachers. It means we don't have to build our own authentication tool, but it also means that we don't have to um, hold any information on the teacher, any personal information. So from a privacy standpoint, it works for everyone all the personal information of the teachers held within the education sector log on and we've got a really great tool a really good great authentication tool to get the teacher onto the platform itself so once once they've signed up through the education sector log on we basically offer them a choice we're asking them to choose between an in-person event and an online event the in-person event is much like the video you saw earlier where the role models actually go into the classroom or to the school um, and inspire the kids in person um, the online event role models can actually dial in and inspire the kids um, through a computer screen. And there are pros for both event type. Um, the online event, um, as much as it was a, uh, a response from, from COVID um, due to kind of the high demand for online solution, solutions, solutions, it also makes it really accessible for all participants. So schools in more rural areas who can't find role models in their region can actually set up an online event and access role models from all across the country. Similarly, role models who have transport limitations, that kind of thing, um, they can, ten, can attend uh, online events really, really easily. Arguably, with in-person events, it's more engaging because they're actually in the same room as the kids. Um, but yet, as I said, there are pros for each uh, event type. So we're asking the teacher to choose an event type. Um, once they've made their choice, uh, 
We then asked them to create what is essentially the role models invitation. Um, so it's a basic form uh, where we ask them to fill out the um, event logistics. So the, the address, the time and the date. Um, really important stuff, but we're also asking about the school itself. So um, the school's co -papa, um, but also some interesting stuff like um, what, you know, what makes the school unique, um, but also some really key information for the for the role model. So um, what what do they, do they need to do when they get to the school? Where do they need to park that kind of thing? Um, is there a policy around taking sharing photos? Um, can they expect any sort of welcome? Will there be a porphyry or will they be expected to do a mihi? Um, all information that we know is going to be really helpful for the role model um, in setting them up to succeed and inspiring the future event. So this is all around that kind of preparation aspect of the tool. So once the teachers filled out that form, so essentially created the invitation for the role model, um, next kind of comes the fun part for the teacher, and that's um, that's choosing a role model. So for an, if they've chosen an in-person event, uh, they're then displayed a group of role models within the region of the school. If they're setting up an online event, then they, they're displayed a group of role models from across New Zealand who have opted in for that particular event type. And here they can browse the role models, look at their um, profiles, and they can add the role, role models that they like to their shortlist down the right there. Um, so they're just building up a shortlist of role, role models that they really like the look of and that they think would be a great fit for an inspiring, a fu the fu inspiring the future event at their school. Um, so here they can move forward and actually preview the event. So they can have a look at the invitation that they've just created. They can also review their um, role models, so their role model shortlist. They can go back and edit this event, and they can also go back and manage their role models. So if they're not happy with a the selection, they can delete the role model, and they can add more as well. This is all a draft event, so no role models will get notified about anything while they're in this kind of draft mode of the event uh, creation step. Once they're happy, then uh, that's when they confirm and send their invitations out to the role models. Um, and an email will go out to all those chosen role models, congratulating them on being invited to an Inspiring the Future event, uh, and also asking them to log back in uh, and actually respond to the uh, invitation itself. We're asking the role models to respond to invitations, to give the, the schools closure, um, and to let them know who's, who's accepted and who's declined. So the role model will log back into their landing page, as you see here. Um, they'll see their invites and their upcoming events, and they'll just need to respond to those invites by um, either accepting them, and then I'll shoot an email back to the teacher, letting them know that this person's accepted the invite, um, or they'll decline it. Um, and we're just asking the role models to just enter in a small message about why they've declined the event. And that'll come to TEC, and that's an example of some of the rich insights that we're gathering um, all throughout the, uh, the platform. Um, so once a role model's accepted an invite, that activates um, some emails that actually fly off to schools and to role models kind of three weeks before, two weeks before, a week before and a day before the event. Um, and in those emails, can, it, uh, we actually offer them those beautiful resources that Tim showed you earlier um, so that the teachers will get a hard copy of the resource pack, but they'll also get all those digital formats, including pre and post activities to run with their class. Step-by-step um, -step guides, the role models get their cultural competency guide and a step-by-step -step guide as well. Um, but all the way leading up to the event, we're setting both parties up to succeed an event to make the experience much better for the, for the children. Anyway, I've probably gone over my time, but thank you very much for listening. I'm going to hand you back over uh, to Tim to, to just tell you, tell you about how to get involved in the program itself. Kia ora, Sam. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate that. So, very. I'm, I'm realising I'd really like to get us into um, to some into some questions. So I've got a, just a couple more slides to get through. Um, clearly, the key here is signing up schools who are interested in signing up volunteers. So the first thing to do is um, we need people from all, literally all walks of life in any job to sign up as role models. Um, if you would like to do that. Uh, the simplest way to do that is go to inspiringthefuture.org.nz and sign up. As I said, um, my, wife, my wife did that last night. It's a simple and easy process to do so. Um, if you're a school, um, we will be launching the um, overall program, if you like, towards the end of this month. Um, and schools can sign up after that 
if they would like to sign up sooner, they can um, fill in an expression of interest page um, on our contact page, and we will contact all uh, of the schools on that contact who have signed up to that contact page once we have gone live. The really interesting thing though here, I think, is actually for um, for businesses, industry organisations, volunteer organisations um, to get involved. I hear every day in my job stories from individual businesses and organisations saying, I can't find more of, um, you know, I can't find more enough staff. Classic example of this, you'll have seen um, recent press coverage around the shortage of IT workers. Um, and so those guys in particular, the IT professionals of New Zealand Association, hugely excited about getting involved um, in this um, once, we, once we launch. I think there's lots of knock-ons for this as well for organisations that want to encourage staff development. This is a great way of doing it. For organisations that want to get involved in their communities, this is a great way of doing it. And of course, it's all taken care of by this platform and the systems and support services that go around it. Um, so a great way to be um, you know, socially engaged in your community, but also to do something that actually benefits your own business by encouraging kids um, to get involved in the area that you work in. Last but not least, um, I think the idea of spreading the word is really important. Um, whether you're using uh, LinkedIn, I posted about the um, this LinkedIn um, the, on LinkedIn this morning around this webinar, but we have a variety of um, materials available for social media posts, whether you use uh, face page or whatever they call it these days, uh, email, intranets, uh, the web, we have materials that you can share uh, and spread the word. So uh, you'll see the web reference there. So look, I have um, really enjoyed presenting uh, along with Sam and the team for you tonight. I'd like to now um, say, uh, let's, get, let's get down to some uh, patai. Um, and if you've got any questions, now's the time to do so. So I think we're going to do that via the chat box. Kelsey, she's nodding. And um, she was, I think Kelsey's going to moderate and then we're going to see where there's some questions there that we can go through. That's right, Tim. Thanks. So um, we'll start question time with the question that came through from Mitch, um, the first question we had, which was about the criminal record check. Um, just the process we go through, I think you want to know. So who sees the information? What's the process for deciding that a person is suitable or not suitable based on the result? Um, with the worry that this could put um, off some role models. Um, so Sam, could you please answer this question? Yeah, of course, it's a really good question, really fair comment. Um, so we, we've been working on the process for some time now. So we have um, one chap who works very closely with myself, our product analyst. Um, he deals with all of our criminal record checks. And what we've devised is, a, is a, what we call a decision matrix. Um, and it's a really handy tool that we've built that actually categorizes all the offenses into basically yes no's um, for role models um, he's the only person that sees the um, the identifiable information um, there is some there are some criminal convictions that are in a, a what we call a bit of a gray area for us um, and when they come through we actually have a, a decision making governance group which we take those um, those cases to um, so that's completely anonymized, but we take it to a group of kind of uh, privacy experts and experts in the field. Um, we discuss it and then we, we kind of make a decision um, based on those SMEs and what, what they tell us to do. Um, and then we'll go back to the role model and actually give them our decision that way. Um, so we do use a decision, decision matrix. It's not, it's not someone sitting in a chair um, making this thing up. Um, it is, it's fairly foolproof, but we, and we do understand that it, it can be really off-putting to role models. That's why we try and make our messaging really, really clear that just because you've got a, a criminal conviction um, or something on your record doesn't mean we're going to um, fail you or not let you to not let you be part of the program at all. Um, everything's up for discussion, but I hope that kind of answers your your question. Great, um, and Sam. Just in the meantime, um, we had a, um, a question about uh, would it be useful to publish um, that criteria and matrix? Yeah, so I think we we may well do that already. We have a safeguarding page on the website, and that's got all our FAQs in there around the criminal um, the criminal record check that we do. Um, so inspiringthefuture.org.nz forward slash safeguarding. Um, so you can find out uh, a whole load more about the criminal record um, check process there. Um, probably better information than I'll be able to give you now. 
Great, thanks, Sam. Um, so we'll move on to a question from Adam about who else TUC is working on, um, working with on this big goal. For example, um, we've mentioned that job preference does not match the expected market. Um, yes, yeah, so who else have we been working on on inspiring the future? Well, maybe I'll have, I'll have a, a couple of a quick go at that. Um, I did mention the food and fibre area earlier, so we're working with uh, Federated Farmers and PICA, which is the primary industry or oh, something coordination uh, group. Um, and the whole point here is actually utilising the, um, the, the distributed networks um, of all the industry associations to actually get involved in this. Um, so whether it's in, um, I've mentioned IT, I've mentioned food and fibre, um, I've had a similar set of conversations with the likes of the engineering fraternity. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed, of course, is that many of these organisations have their own individual process of trying to get into schools. Um, and for the schools, this is extremely frustrating uh, and difficult to manage because you've effectively got, you know, the, the, the old phrase, 17 cars up the driveway. What we're trying to do here, therefore, is provide a bit of a platform that allows all of that original activity to happen, but do it in a way that's actually easily, um, much easier to access and manage on behalf of the schools. Um, and that just did, did, did lead me, one, I just want to segue into one thing um, which I neglected to mention in my corridor uh, quarter or earlier, and that is that in relation to the, the um, materials that we provide, we've done a lot of work here trying to connect um, the uh, Inspiring the Future work into the curriculum in the primary schools. Um, and so a lot of the resource pack actually demonstrates how it slots in alongside many of the subjects that are actually delivered within schools. And of course, that helpfully connects into some of those industry groups as well. Let's just say in science as an example. Mm -hmm. Okay, great answer. Thanks, Tim. Um, so the next question is from Val. Um, has this platform also been used in a marae-based kaupapa, i.e. for rural rangatahi? Um, I'd like to answer that. Um, I could talk to the fact that um, when we've trialled Inspiring the Future events, what's been really important for us is that we've trialled it in all sorts of different schools. We don't just want this to work in high decile schools in Auckland. So we've gone to um, Māori medium schools in um, Gisborne, up on the East Cape. Uh, we've trialled it up in um, schools in Auckland. We've also been down to Dunedin. Um, so we've trialled this with lots of different schools um, just to make sure that it um, works across the board. Um, I would say, um, but um, it hasn't been trialled on a Mirai as such, um, but I, I hope that answers your question. Let me know if not. Great, thanks Andrea. Um, the next question is from Monica and that's, can role models specify what schools or areas they prefer to engage with? I think this might be one for you, Sam. To Sam, yeah. Yeah, um, they can't yet. So. The, the way we match uh, schools and role models is by region, but it's just based around where the role model lives. So it's definitely something we're looking to in the future. This is what, what we're kind of calling our MVP of the platform, um, but we're moving into um, profile building and a bit more around matchmaking as well, um, and also role model preferences, because um, actually just where they live isn't quite good enough for us. Um, we want role models to be able to um, uh, choose to potentially role models uh, um, the, the school that they went to, which might be on the other side of the country. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do around that preferences section of the role model uh, profile creation. Um, and that's definitely on the horizon. So it's, it's a great suggestion and something we've been talking about recently quite a lot. Sam, if I can just add into that and to, uh, to Totoko your, um, your comment. One of the things that's really obvious to us is that, um, and the same thing happens, it often happens in, in um, boards of trustees as an example, is that the places which most desperately need um, uh, access to different people are precisely the places where those, um, those jobs are not closely located to the school. So uh, we need, um, you know, we need to have people who are physiotherapists and surgeons uh, and vets inside uh, our lower decile schools. Otherwise, we are literally going to continue to sort of see the same things that we've seen in the past uh, around people going on to doing the jobs 
um, that um, they have they have seen either their parents or uh, other folks in their broader Fano do. And so, so from our perspective, there's a there's a bit of a balance to be had, which is we'd love to see some um, preference to be given to the way in which um, role models um, can select what they do, but equally, we want um, schools to be able to actually think, gee, we'd love to have our kids exposed to different things. This is the this is the sort of the balance that we're after. Okay, great. Thanks, both of you. Um, so here's a really good question um, from Mitch. So how does this link to other career resources and activities to support schools and learners as part of a school-wide career development program, or is it more standalone at the moment? Kia ora, Mitch. I think I know which Mitch that is, and um, Nam Mahi, good to hear. Good to have you back on the web. On the web. Um, so look, the the key thing that this is going to uh, connect to, um, Mitch, is um, a product that we are developing at the moment. It is an online careers platform. It is um, we've got a working name for it at the moment, which means which is Terapa Two, which which sort of broadly means stargazer, um, and it is a. It will be the first online um, free to all New Zealanders um, careers planning tool available uh, in New Zealand. We're going to be launching it um, early in 2022, um, and it is it it, allow, it goes through that process of um, you know it uses the soda model, uh, Mitch um, goes through that process of allowing people to self discover. Um, so clearly leads on from things like inspiring the future um, and what we'd hope to have within a very short period of time is every New Zealand high school student not just having access to um, this particular tool but having a careers plan. So we are extremely excited about that and I note that one of my board members is on tonight, Nancy, and we're going to be discussing it very soon at our, at our next board meeting um, and we're really looking forward to rolling it out with the um, around the multi. Great. Um, so thanks, Karen, for the heads up. So I've just missed a question um, from earlier from Peter, who said um, he's interested in the support provided to role models to be in to be effective engagers with Tamariki and Angatahi. So that's the support what they get when they go into schools. I think it's not. I think Andrew. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so we spent quite a lot of time to Tim's earlier point in developing the resources. What we recognise is that. And um, the platform for us makes inspiring the future very scalable. Um, so there isn't somebody from TEC, for example, hand holding events. But we know that what that means is that the resources have to work really hard and um, both for teachers and for role models. And um, so that each and every time role models in schools can walk away feeling like they've been a really positive experience. Um, so we spend a lot of time developing the step by step guide um, over various trial events across the country. We've met with um, or tens and tens of volunteers from all different walkways and pathways um, to check that that works for them. And then we've collected feedback um, after events as well. So we know the step by step guide in particular works really hard for us. Um, and then there are additional um, resources we've developed as well that, that Tim talked to. So our cultural competency guide. We know that there can be some nervousness around um, how to present yourself at a Maori medium school if you need to do your, um, your mihi. Um, so there's some guidance around that. And then we've also got a bit, a bit of a tips and tricks video as well. So that's where role models get to hear from other role models who've already been taken part in events. Um, and again, to Sam's earlier point, this is a minimum viable product. So there's more we can build on, um, but we think is a starting a starting place. Um, yet those resources work really well for everybody. OK, great. Um, and so we've just got a few minutes left, so I'll try and get through these as quickly as possible. Um, so from Debbie, does the school have the ability to ask for a role model in a certain career so they get a good mix? Um, Sam, <laughs> one's a good one for you. Um, so not yet. So we've we've kind of purpose, purposefully left out any sort of um, role model filtering or, or search at the moment. They're, they're more than welcome to browse through all the role models. Um, but we're doing a larger piece of work around um, kind of unconscious bias, teacher bias as well, um, and how we kind of advise a teacher on on a diverse range of role models to choose. Um, so eventually they will they will be able to choose based on role. Um, they'll, they'll be able to choose based on a lot of things as well that we ask for within the profile creation of a, of a role model. Um, but yeah, for MVP at the moment, we're just kind of offering up all the role models on the platform at the, at the moment for them to choose from. Yeah. OK, great answer. 
Um, so just in the last few minutes, I'll just get to um, some of the questions that came in when people were registering for the webinar. Um, so this one will be really helpful for people. It's what do kids want to hear from role models? I could talk to that a little bit, if you like. Um, so again, in all the research that we've done, we hear a few things. Um, jobs is part of it, but it is just part of it. And um, pathways is really important as well. Um, what journey did you take? And I think often kids' minds are pretty blown to know that somebody doesn't just take one job and just stay in that career for the rest of their lives. Um, so what pathway people took, um, even outside of education, what other experiences did they have along the way? Because it might be that an experience that a role model has echoes an experience that a young people, uh, that a young person um, is going through at the moment as well. So um, I'd say stories as, as well as jobs. Okay, great. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so the next question is, um, that came in through when people were registering were, um, why is it aimed at primary and intermediate schools? Um, I think I can answer that question myself, actually. Um, so the reason that we're focusing on this age group is because that's where you can really make a difference um, and introduce the aspirational thinking that can support career decisions and goals um, before these, um, actually when these students enter secondary schools. Um, so lots of research, um, international research has shown that what kids aspire to be when they're seven actually affects what subjects, subjects they choose when they go to secondary school and then what they end up being later in life. So it's a really about getting in at that early age, um, busting those biases and just showing children what's out there. Doesn't necessarily mean children need to pick a path that young. It just means that they know what's out there and they can, they're empowered to make better decisions. Um, so we'll just do one last question as the webinar's probably about, actually the webinar, sorry guys, the webinar's probably about to end, um, so we'll have to leave it there. Any more questions that come through, um, we'll just, we'll, we'll email you the answers. Also, you're also welcome to email us um, at that email address on there, which is customerservice at tc.govt.nz and let us know any of your questions and we'll reply to you then. All right, so Tim, if you just want to wrap up. That is us for this evening, folks. I just wanted to um, thank uh, everyone for joining us tonight to uh, have a bit of a corridor around around this particular piece of work. As you can tell, I think from um, the team involved, we're um, we're rather excited about it. And I can see from some of the, uh, the comments that are going on uh, still to this moment, um, I think you are too. Thank you very much for joining us. Can I thank our team for actually taking um, and doing a massive amount of work to get this webinar up and running. Um, wish you all well and go sign up. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora.